Welcome to today's episode for people interested in the extraordinary, yet ancient and often long forgotten stuff. This is your host, Joseph Schinwald from ownbythebeach.com. And our guest today is Vicky Williams. Hello, Vicky. Hi, Joseph. How are you? It's great to have you here from England and Mallorca. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Our topic today is empowering physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Victoria has over 30 years of experience in the field with a zest for life and a passion for health and well-being. She's a therapist, educator, coach, and international speaker. She's also the CEO of a company which is called Galileo Therapy UK. And I will, in the show notes, provide the website, uh, the website to this uh, business. So believing that in every person's lifetime, we are all going to need physical rehabilitation of some sort. Some will need more than others. We could, uh, how do you actually define health? What does it mean to you? <laughs> Joseph, that's a, it's a tough one. It's, uh, you know, when I was lecturing for over like 10 years, I remember it's the first question I would ask the um the students and so many questions come back and really I think the the best way um, to describe it is really to touch on the you know I have physical health that I can move all my limbs um, I can you know I'm, I'm physically able to do stuff emotionally um, I feel you know happy and healthy and well so the emotional side of it as well feeling joy um, and the spiritual side of it as well. And I don't mean the um, religious side of it, but just spiritually feeling, you know, that um, we have a purpose as well in life and that, you know, um, we feel spiritually whole as well. Yeah, and it's probably all, it's, it's all interrelated, um, you know. Yeah. You can't, you can't be really for a long time physically healthy if you're emotionally not or if you're mentally not, right? Uh, it does affect the whole thing. So um, let's talk about physical, emotional, and spiritual health. So can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yes, well, um, you know, I started my um, my career really in physical, um, in the in rehabilitation of elite athletes. And really, um, you know, I was really busy learning all the anatomy, the physiology, all the things you learn, um, when you're doing the therapy side of things and, you know, functional movement and, uh, you know, is the athlete uh, physically able to, um, I don't know, in my case in football, run up and down a, a pitch for 90 minutes? Are they physically able to, you know, use their skills, et cetera, et cetera? And it was only sort of a few years after doing that, I started watching the players and started noticing that, you know, if they were having a, uh, a little bit of trouble at home or anything like that, that then, you know, that would affect their game and started really looking into the, you know, um, then more into the emotional or the psychological side of health as well. And that, you know, how they can be off their game. So really, you know, this, um, it was key to me um, starting in my career in, uh, in football because it I wasn't really a football fan so I had to learn movement and patterns and things like that very quickly as well as the anatomy and physiology of everything but it, it showed me um started showing me there was a bigger um side to rehabilitation and at the time you know back 30 plus years ago it was it was all just very physical rehabilitation and nobody talked about emotional health or spiritual health um, yes. Yeah, I mean, it was. It's interesting, really. That yes, it's how... a, now I realize that also. Yes, it's true. There wasn't a topic. Mental health no. was taboo. Yeah, <clears throat> there wasn't. There wasn't a topic at all. And you know what I saw is these young players would come in, and the pressure, you know, to go out and and perform in front of thousands of people, sometimes to be booed off the pitch was an incredibly hard to watch and you you know you could almost guarantee that that um you know that player would get injured as well and I started seeing you know the uh 
the interaction between the physical and the emotional health. Um, you know, I even wrote, I did my master's, you know, on the, on the difference in, um, you know, uh, footballers who are elite, you know, footballers to Sunday league footballers. And we looked into all the different things, you know, not only the pitches and the kit that they had and the money that was behind them, but also, you know, um, emotionally what they were going through. So I was already, you know, knowing, um, there was something more behind people getting injured than just a, a physical um, interaction with another player. Yeah, I, I heard actually that uh, some Olympic athletes who actually, you know, get silver or gold medals, that after this is over, they've been working for 10 years on it, they get actually depressed. It can yeah. happen. Okay. I think it has, it has a lot to do, I think, with when you work on a, on a goal, like, you know, as uh, like elite sports person, then, and then it's reached, it's just like a businessman who suddenly sells his business, right? For a lot of money. And now he's not anymore in the business. So he was growing it or the, you know, the sports person was working for this goal and then it's reached and there is uh, no more growth in, because you have it, you have to look for something new and you have to get inspired again with, with a new experience Yeah, absolutely. And um, I particularly saw that not only in the football world where you're retiring at 32, pretty much broken. A lot of the guys, you know, had, you know, fused ankles or, you know, um, injured knees. They had a lot of injuries that, you know, they sort of could feel themselves getting older. You know, you could you could definitely see see this in the in the football world. But also during my training with with Premier Training, we were getting lots of other elite athletes, ex-military or military people who, uh, um, you know, had, who had been, you know, always had a, um, a purpose, all of a sudden trying to, um, I don't know, reinvent themselves really. And, um, you know, you could see that, you know, purpose is, is a really, is a key factor to our health, having purpose, um, is very important and I agree totally with you I was only talking about this the other day I having a goal is one thing but when you achieve it you've got to make sure that you're ready for the next goal and as we age as well our goals change but also our um, you know our abilities change in different ways so and um, there's many many factors that take um, to take into consideration and obviously male and females are also very different as well for obvious reasons. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally experiencing this right now. I'm 62. And, you know, I, I was always a, like an adventurer. I, I did what I wanted to do, right? I mean, like traveling, world travels and all this, or, or studies in different countries. And now I feel like sometimes I want to do this and that, but, you know, I have to really examine my beliefs because there are self-sabotaging beliefs that because I'm getting older, can I still do it? Do I believe in it, Right. That's uh, definitely a thing of the ages also. When you're young, 20 years, 30 years. But it, you have to actually achieve that elite status in sports then at this age because as a deadline, you, you don't uh, get a chance after 40. So it's like very intense. And then you're 30, you reached it, and now comes a, a meaning of life question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, totally for me, I was just listening to um, to the news yesterday about Lewis Hamilton and, you know, um, and how now at his age, you know, he's getting old and it just makes me laugh, you know. But if you're um, if you're, a tra um, you know, an Ironman and um, looking at Ironman or triathletes, um, my sister is, you know, she's in her 50s. She she did the Ironman in her 40s. And they say, you know, with some of these sports you actually you seem to be better with age. So it, it's, it's a really, it's a really big question um, for different populations in this when it comes to sport. But there's also the, uh, the, you know, the added saying where, you know, in our minds we are 20 and then, you know, our body's 50 plus or 60 plus and we think we can go out and do what we used to do and, um, and wonder why we get injured or <laughs> end up putting or setting ourselves back six months again. You know, so, our, you know, if our minds and hearts are are there, but our body's not keeping up with us, then um, we're in trouble as well. You know, because, you know, you have to be able 
to to understand yourself as a whole and when they say age is just a number that's that's completely true however there are certain physical challenges that will come along when as you get older that will not happen to you when you're 20 so it's about understanding the self and this is why as well you know that we need to realize that we're all very unique you know in that way and so um when, but most of all, we need to do stuff that makes us happy, um, you know, and then we're more likely to continue with it. But getting injured all the time is, you know, it is a sign that you're doing the wrong things. Yes, I think it's 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 um, almost like, a, you know, a very deep question why we have this desire to have those those experiences and to reach that kind of level of perfection, of mastery in life. And some people become very accomplished. Others, they um, get stuck on the way. But ultimately for me, it's, it, it relates a little bit to why are we here on earth? You know, why are we here? Why do we live? Is it because we want experiences? Is it because we really know that life is experiences? And uh, But then we get this restraint of our body, first of all, through the senses, because, you know, as beautiful as, as they are, and they allow us to experience the world, but then again, they limit us. So, you know, if you consider yourself as like a spirit living in this body, then you know what I'm talking about. But it's, it's a mental model, of course, not everybody thinks that way. But the body and the mind and the, the you know, the, the spirit, how would you, how would you look at it from your perspective? How does it all interrelate? And how does it relate to our health, like physical, emotional, mental, spiritual? I I think, you know, I, I can look at this in, in different ways, you know, um, you can look at somebody like uh, Sadhguru, uh, Joe Dispenza, who at the moment, um, or Greg Braden, all these people are um, mm -hmm. answering these questions and more for a lot of people. But from my experience, um, for the last 14 years, you know, I've been dealing with people who have, um, who are physically challenged now for, for whatever reason, maybe they've been diagnosed with a medical condition you know, such as MS or had a stroke or you know, maybe they have cancer or they are they are not only um, older, but they are also physically challenged. And I think it's when, you know, sometimes when you're at your darkest times, I know for myself when I went through it in my 30s, it's through those darkest times that you, you find, um, you know, you find another side of you. Um, Because they say, you know, if you if you do what you always did, you get what you always got. So you can't do what you did at 20. You can't train the way you used to do at 20. You're a different person. You know, we're ever evolving and ever changing. At the end of the day, you know, we are pure energy. And, you know, I remember when I used to have to teach, you know, over 25 years ago, I used to have to teach energy. Um, when I used to teach uh, the massage side of the courses, And I'd get the students looking at me and I, um, as a spiritual person, used to talk about um, energy such as Reiki, which you didn't even talk about back in those days. And I had to go and find the science of, of what energy was all about. But in those days, you could actually measure your energy, um, you know, through um, photography, you know. And so, you know, it helped me a little bit to look for the scientific explanations although I don't need the scientific explanations other people do sometimes you know every living being on this earth has got um you know has got energy and it stems from for us from the, the from the cell from the cellular level the mitochondrial level and it's about keeping those energy levels within those cells completely um in homeostasis and well And that takes a lot more than just um, physical exercise or good nutrition. It takes, um, you know, an emotional, um, you know, way of being as well and, um, and a lifestyle as well. So, you know, so much goes into this that, you know, I think I'll be looking into this and researching this till till the day I die because it's never ending 
And I think some of us are searchers and some of us, you know, will um, will not be interested in this. But when you do become ill or physically challenged or um, less able to do what you used to do, it's then that you start looking into this realm of what health really means. Um, you know, I have a love for functional medicine and functional neurology, and they are beginning to really help um, focus on on these subjects. And, you know, if you do a questionnaire with a functional medicine doctor, they will take you right back to how you were born. And any trauma that may have happened in your life, they now know can stay with within, within you, um, you know, on a cellular level. Um, you only have to look at um, things like ACEs, which is afflicted childhood experiences. We know that that is affecting you as an adult. The science is there. The research is there. And so we are learning at a very, very fast pace. And as you'll remember, Joseph, this sort of stuff was not talked about, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And now this is all we talk about and everybody's an expert. So now a lot of people... <laughs> Because of them, because of the um, social media and and everything, everyone's looking for answers and getting more and more confused. (laughs) So it's a difficult one. Um, But you mentioned it before, actually. Sorry. No, no, that no, that's that's it. It's just a difficult one to to answer because you know um, I think it's for um, people to start helping. Um, people decipher the um, the rubbish and the good stuff because there's also a lot of rubbish out there that is nonsense. Yeah. You know, a lot of nonsense out there that people are talking about. And so, my, you know, I always say to people, um, you know, especially people who come to me, first of all, I'm going to empower you. Um, you know, you're going to get results, and if you don't get results, sack me. You know, this is what I love about the football side of things, you know, that um, if you don't fix people, you get sacked, but you can go to therapists, whether it's for mental health or physical health. And for years and years, you can be going through therapy and you're not getting any better and no one's questioning this because, you know, I think the more that you question and, and research, the more empowered as a, as a person you will become, you know. Yeah, that's why I like your the business, Galileo Therapy. The name is great because, you know, Galileo, as we know, he had, uh, like, he changed the perception of the people who thought, you know, everything is circling around the earth, while that was not true. And uh, it was revolutionary at his time, of course. Church didn't like it. But now we have, like, particularly when you were in Mallorca and when we met the first time, we talked about Joe Dispenza. We had a wonderful conversation. And that's, like, he brings this in, what other scientists also bring in. It's like, you know, the, vib- the, the vibrations, the frequencies, which is energy and which mm-hmm. creates all these manifestations and the variety of the world and of us. And um, that they are, it's like we are moving when you, when, when we are moving this a little bit up from the atomic, um, the, the matter to a lighter, the lighter being, which is more like, you know, going up in frequencies it has to do with the chakras. And uh, that's, of course, what we talked about. And I, f- I find it uh, fascinating how he mentions that in the chakras, the energy centers, that there, you know, with his meditations, there is old information. There's useless information in there, like a trauma, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, it creates beliefs, whatever. There's a trillion things, which really are unconscious then, and uh, they block us. So uh, we get then pain from it, you know. So the whole meditation for, and you have been actually at a live event with Joe Dispenza, so I want to ask you how, how that experience was. But, you know, what I like is that he sees it as, you know, blessing the energy centers with new information, with more useful information. It does just a blessing for each energy center because the information is what is carried within the energy. The energy is not just energy. There is information in the energy, in the frequency, in the vibration, there's information. And if that information can be changed through meditation, like he does, and you know more about it, so I would like to know more about it, but it makes sense to me. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, dealing with uh, Galileo um, 
therapy for you know I think now over 14 years after finding that that is um you know work on frequency everything works on frequency um I started researching you know um you know all our organs work on um, on different frequency levels as well and so if someone gets sick um you know disease means the body is at this ease and so the frequencies of the body are are not are not you know firing properly i i liken our energies to um we need to finally tune them and we need tools to finally tune the energies within our within our body you know um on that cellular level as well as the emotional level and you know it's like you know finally tuning it is is hard work and so you know a lot of people are trying to search for for ways to do that and Joe Dispenza I always remember was in um you know a film called The Secret you know the famous um book and he was ridiculed, you know, for his work. And as quite a lot of us were in the days who were even talking spiritually. And he went away and scientifically um, can prove everything he does. And so he talks a lot about his work at the events. And um, when I was there, he was also with uh, Greg Braden. Um, some of the other guys are at a big conference and they are bringing awareness of the consciousness. But um, he basically, in a nutshell, he says what you think and what you feel through your heart center is what you become. And this really ties in with the Heart Math Institute, which uh, started back, I think, in the 1990s that showed that how you think and how you feel affects your heart rate. And we don't just mean your your heart rate as what you would know, taking your pulse. But, um, you know, we look now looking at heart rate variability. And, um, you know, heart rate variability is a a massive tool now for elite athletes as well. It shows you your true health because, you know, information is is power. And the more information we have on our on our body, you know, the better, you know, um, now all these devices can tell us how we slept. Um, You know, I have an aura ring I've just got, which I love. It tells me. um, how I slept, you know, how much REM sleep, deep sleep, what my recovery rate is, whether I'm ready to to go and train hard or not, you know, what my temperature did, because the temperature is also helping you realize what your health is. And so maybe now, you know, we're looking into prevention. And I think the one thing I love the most about being at Joe Dispenza's um, event was that I met um, some amazing doctors and the doctors were there with their patients, which just blew my mind that doctors are now realizing um, this stuff and taking their patients, you know, to these events to help them, you know. And what we need now is more open mind um, medical profession, you know, professional people to to show people that you can't just do, you know, a 10 minute consultation and and give people pills but you know sadly they they, you know they're doing their best with the time that they've got and and every country will have a different way of of dealing with healthcare. you know I worked in America for for three years and um you know um things are very very different to here in the UK um and so what I've seen is that you know Joe Dispenza's um work is incredibly scientific um and that's what I love but in my heart you know I've always known it and it's just that thankfully people like Joe and Greg Braden are just actually managing to package this information up and make more people listen and um, you know some of us knew it a long time ago and it's nice to have it packaged in this way um, like you say, the chakras, I'm a yoga teacher as well. So the, the, the yogis knew this well before Joe Dispenza. So this is, um, you know, this is um, ancient, ancient um, work that's now us as human beings are beginning to, to tap into to this energy. Yeah, he does mention uh, quite often like Tibet and Buddhism. And uh, I read his books and I, I bought some uh, meditations and I really like them uh, because I like the Tibetan Buddhism stuff, you know, particularly that insight where he talks about 
you know, when you go through the chakra meditations, there are four huge, uh, there's a series, there's number one, number two, each one is like one hour, each meditation. And it basically, you know, it's, it's about what the Kundalini yoga talks about. It's uh, what um, the Chinese talk about this, uh, you know, this, this uh, yin and yang energy, which is uh, supposed to move upwards. And uh, so what I see is that that whole thing, which we have been completely un, uh, unaware of, that we are surrounded, everybody is, with huge space. And even it's in us, the space. So like if you go to the atom level and the electron, there's just enough space, like it's another universe. So it's like typically Buddhism, you know, it's like that thing that there are, there is this void, like the humans, they say the humans, we as humans, usually we are like a fish is surrounded by water uh, and he doesn't know about water. Because the fish is, it doesn't know about water. The fish is just swimming in the water, but that's his ambience. And humans are surrounded with air, right? They, they breathe air. But they say the Buddhists, you know, the Tibetans, you know, they say that the Buddha is aware of his surrounding. It's void. It's emptiness. And the Hindus say shonyata. But ultimately, what it is, it's not a word, of course. You know, it's not a word. It's it's our surrounding. And we are not only surrounded by nothingness, but that nothingness, no thing, nothing, no thing. That is actually the field of infinite possibilities. That's where we actually come from. And it's not out there. It's inside of us. Mm-hmm. So when we are looking mm-hmm. for it, we are looking at ultimate reality. It's not out there. It's each one of us. And it is all emptiness and emptiness is that interdependent co-origination with everything else in this uh, universe. I, I know sometimes they say like, you know, you are basically when you look at the universe, you are, you can say, I am the universe. I'm everything because you're so interconnected with the sun, with the air, with the trees, with everything, right? And you can say you're everything. As far as I look, it's me. Because everybody has this mm-hmm. like the central axis, the axis mundi, where we are, and it goes up there for for infinity. <laughs> and there, you don't really um, disturb anybody else in that. You are completely autonomous in your own Buddhahood, so to speak. Right. What I want to mention here is that uh, Joe Dispenza actually mentions that uh, he learned meditation. Well, he didn't say he learned it, but from them, but he said they have the best definition of what meditation is. And it is to familiarize yourself with yourself. So going there that we are actually, and you mentioned this before, you have to first get to know yourself and your desires before you actually can work on any improvement because it's not objective. It's like, like you said, you have to have the thoughts and the emotions, the feelings together. They have to be there. Like almost the feelings, if you want to be better, want to feel better, you have to have that future being already feel it. You have to feel it already now. And so that your intention to feel better actually comes about. But what I like is that with the new new science, Joe Dispenza, he probably uses a lot also because he knows he has a lot of people who are ridiculing him or, you know, and, and he's one of many masters, of course. But it's that the that, that this field of infinite possibility is actually that which is invisible, and we can actually reach out to it or be be it in a sense by raising our our frequency, and that's Mr. Chakras, just getting them in alignment and harmonizing them. I mean, for me, this is all very theoretical, of course. I haven't been to one of his uh, events, but uh, what I wanted to say is definitely what we also talked here in Mallorca when we talked. It was a wonderful conversation. It was about that incredible theme in all religions, which is you have to get the heart and the brain, so to speak, you know, like physically speaking now, or you can also say it spiritually, the heart and the, the mind. You have to get it like in alignment. And, you know, the heart actually has its own brain, like all chakras have their own brains. But they are specialized, you know, because when they when they transplant the heart, there there are some examples where they actually craved for food, certain foods which the person who had that heart before was was liking, and and for the ones who had this new heart or this new kidney or whatever, 
And they have their own brains in a sense. It's all like organized cells where you say also the energy starts on that cellular level. But ultimately, I think it's uh, not just our brain that gives us a, a great lifestyle and a happy, blissful fulfillment, but it's the heart is uh, most importantly. And in all religions is this. They all strive, like not in all religions now, but I'm just mentioning Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism. They'll strive for that unity. That's like a goal in meditation, that unity. My question is really, you know, how did it ever get separated? I mean, you know, why are our thoughts sometimes so disconnected from our feelings? What would be your answer to that? I, I was actually, it's funny. Um, I was just about to, to mention that we've all become so distracted um, through life in general. And um, these distractions will um, these days be work or family life or social media or whatever it is. I was just watching the story of um, social media the other day and how even David Bowie back in the day was, was saying that this, this, this technology is, is going to change humans in a different way. But also, you know, we love it for the information that it gives us, but everyone is distracted. So whereas, you know, years ago you would pick a subject for instance I did NLP I became a practitioner I studied it I worked on it I practiced it and then I moved on to my next subject I wanted to learn people are jumping from subject to subject to subject and and you know not practicing it like you say somebody might think well I'm going to go and try Buddhism for a while because that's going to make me feel better we are, we are distracting ourselves because a lot of people are, you know, have, have become unhappy and, um, you know, because of, or, or for whatever reason that nobody's just present anymore. You know, I, I noticed that in, in our lives, the stress, especially through the pandemic, some people have worked even harder than they have ever worked. And, you know, the stress is very paramount in their lives and it's showing up in their health and everyone is working harder. You know, when I was young, my, my father used to go to work and, you know, start work at nine, come home at five. And that was it. You know, he was answering emails at eight o'clock at night <laughs> or 24 seven, whereas we're all on tap 24 seven. So all these distractions, they, they don't give us that time. And then we keep thinking, well, oh, do you know what? I'm going to do a bit of yoga tonight. I'm going to start a class and oh, I'll do it next week or the week after. And then all of a sudden you get diagnosed with, um, you know, a disease of some kind that's going to affect you. And, um, you know, I've seen this happen in the last 14 years with, with the people that I've worked with, um, with a young woman, especially, we could we could see all the signs that her health was deteriorating, and you know we could give advice of certain things. And you know now, um, you know, fourteen years later, she you know she is struggling to stand and walk because you know she has a condition of the brain that is deteriorating very quickly. Um, you know, this woman fourteen years ago was a fit, healthy woman. Um, you know, doing training with me and um, using the Galileo which you know we were talking about and for fitness and for weight you know for for, for feeling better now we're using it to to just try and keep her body stable and to get some sort of um, continuity for her and to help her be the best version of herself you know we're never going to cure that disease it's when we um, we face um I don't know, it's what, like I said the other day, my, my friend who, who he faced um, a tumour in the brain and was told, you know, he had the most deadliest um, cancer in the world and was faced with, you know, death even for him. And seven years later, he's still here. He's here because he physically and spiritually and emotionally believed of all his soul he could fight this. And now he is out there helping other people. It's when we go through these these times that we start searching a bit more. And, um, you know, that's suppose, you know, that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing now, because, you know, I was so broken from um, my career and working seven days a week and surgery that went horribly wrong that I just quit everything uh, at the age of 40. And um, by pure accident or divine invention, whichever one you want to call it, I found Galileo and 
14 years on, I've been able to, you know, now help um, people who are, you know, considerably physically challenged. Um, and But also I work with them on a very holistic level. And, you know, unless that person really wants to come and work with me with all their heart and soul, then they're, they're not going to, they're not going to improve. And so, you know, some people say to me, oh, I need to get my dad to come see you or my mom. And I say, no, don't push them. If they're not ready to heal, then the healing won't happen. It's not, it's not, you know, I'm just a um, a stepping stone to help introduce, you know, um, that there is a bit of hope. But the work ultimately is down to us, not the therapist. Um, it's It's important. And, you know, it's such a huge subject. And it's a bit like the computer industry and how quickly that evolved in our time as well, Joseph. I think um, human spirituality mm-hmm. and you know, energy is moving at a very, very fast level. And um, and the human race, as we know it, are, are, is literally changing. And um, depending which part in the world you, you live in as well, it also makes a difference. You know, as we know, in Mallorca, people are still living off the land as farmers. And, you know, it's, it's still a lot of it's unspoiled, um, old traditional lifestyle, you know, and you don't get to see that very much. And so, you know, I think that old civilization is is still in us all. And that's where Greg Braden comes in. You know, the blueprint of, of humans is, is still in there. But ultimately, our health is up to us. And there are practitioners like, my, you know, myself and other people out there who can help guide people. But my goal was to stop people from becoming a cash cow to therapists because so many people... Um, were were paying so much money and not getting results and so if you're not getting the results then you need to change what you're doing and um you know I just found that for me with 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 Galileo not only the um the technology but also the company behind it was such they are such a wonderful heartfelt um beautiful family company the the ethics behind it just all sat well with me plus the results that I've been getting you know for the for the last 14 years have been phenomenal for people who've been told that nothing more can be done I think you know that that's my my challenge is when someone turns around and says right this is it you're 50 years old and you're never going to be able to do this and I'm just like well show me you know or I'll show you and just watch sort of thing you know it's it's like um you know, I, I've had a stroke 20 years ago and my doctor said I'd never walk or be able to to move again. All right, let's have a go. You know, never say never. But I do believe ultimately it's not just the physical, it's the the emotional, the heart felt. Like you say, the heart is the second brain or they say it's the first brain of the body now. And you've got to really want it. But also you've got to give people hope. But it's those distractions that stop us from, you know, from from searching so much and um yeah yeah for me prevention is better than cure and that's yes. what i try and educate mm-hmm. people to do yeah. yeah so that's an interesting company uh which you brought from germany to england yeah. and it was not yeah. easy but now i looked at the website and that will be in the show notes there are all there's more about it and people who are interested in it can read about it of course so Yeah, I think that's a very valuable lessons I can learn here and our audience, uh, that connection between heart and mind and or heart and, 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 and brain. You know, these words are just words, but obviously we know that uh, the brain can think about many things and it's very good. It's good as a map for reality. It's good for getting our intentions in life into words, so to speak, right? Uh, like mm-hmm. I want to be free. Well, that's an intention. But what is the feeling of it? The feeling is abundance, right? Or health and all this, right? Because you're not free anymore if you have a health problem or if you don't have financial security or, you know, you can't do anymore what you want to do. Or if you don't have a great relationship and um, or, or never had, <laughs> whatever. But it's like always connected with this relationship between our thoughts, the map of reality and our heart which is our feeling. 
And it goes back to us inwardly, to something where you say, you know, I can understand why this is separated because we have this egoistic mind. We get, we got it from, from survival, probably. It's not a bad thing, you know. We have created an image of ourselves, like people also create an image of God, you know. We've created an image of ourselves, and that's, but it's often unconscious and it can sabotage us. But that image is... The way it really sabotages us the most is when we don't know it's an image, when we forget it, when we identify ourselves with it. And then the feelings are locked. They are kind of separated, I believe, you know, because now you are not anymore your wholesome being where thoughts just occur and happen, but they're not the highest level because the highest level is your consciousness, your awareness, your higher self, which, you know, the higher self is something we all can believe in because we are, we are definitely, you know, when we are in the egoic mind, that cannot be our higher self, you know, what we identify with, uh, material things, objective things, um, you know, we identify ourselves as the body, but we are not the body, we are consciousness. And to get there means to harmonize all the chakras and then basically, particularly to actually um, center ourselves on the feeling and the feelings like you mentioned you do this out of compassion out of uh, empathy well not everybody has that insight right I mean I'm useless in the medical industry because I'm just a different person I I like I, I just uh, you know I'm not that kind of person not everybody is and there are these four kinds of yoga as you know in India right there is this you know, the, the intellectual thing, the chinana, but there's the bhakti yoga, the devotional, the karma yoga, to do great things in life, to do good, like people in hospitals. And then there's the scientific, the racha one, where you actually scientifically, like, you know, like really get to know yourself and, and how you work, actually, how it all works together uh, through meditation. So, and through yoga. So I think... This is this is for me the question. What do you think? Uh, how do you see why we humans have this separated thought, sometimes completely disconnected from our feelings? People say, you know, most people that they are not in touch with their feelings. Uh, they're living in their head, and they're not even in touch with the reality. In so far, if they go out, you know, for a nice walk in the mountains, they still think about problem solving you know the stuff cannot in the beginning right it takes a few days probably to walk in nature and you can actually completely experience it again like a feeling and appreciate it with your heart because you're part of it you're it and so what do you think why you why we have this uh, trouble with uh, having our brain and our our heart our feeling in sync and we are aware of it we are conscious of it um it's a good question actually because I, I've watched it more and more and especially like you were saying about Mallorca you know you always think right if I go and, and put myself in a retreat for um, a month in India or go to a, a Buddhist retreat then all my problems will be solved you know and um and it's funny when it's not the place it the, the, you know like we we can go to Mallorca or we can go wherever we want it, we think we want to go but if if you're still stressed I I would I put it down to stress I think we are um more and more people have have stress and this word has been bounced around like it's nothing for so long and because we are so stressed um we basically can't see the wood for the trees we we can't really feel um, those feelings. And, you know, the more that I, I see some of these chronic um, conditions and illnesses and so many people around me have been having strokes and heart attacks since we've come out, you know, in the middle of this pandemic, the stress is unbelievable. It's knowing whether you are in that stress or not. Um, I'm seeing it in the younger generation, especially because they internalize it. And I think more and more is um, expected from us, not in, in our daily lives, in our home lives, in our work lives. And that stress disorientates us. And so unless we give ourselves that peace, um, yes. we can't make sense of it. 
Now, going back to the meditation, I, I went through a very personal time a good few years ago where I literally was like a rabbit in headlights. For, and I was really personal thing that happened. And I, and I couldn't, I couldn't see, I couldn't, I was just a, a wreck and I was doing everything I could to change my state because I could feel that my body was in immense amount of, of stress, but I couldn't change it. And that's when I um, really learned to meditate properly with uh, actually sad guru. I did one of his mm-hmm. courses, which is called inner engineering. Mm-hmm. And the, the thing was to do, uh, it was a four day course. And I thought, yeah, yeah, I'll try it because I'm, I, I love yoga and I love meditation, but I always had to have guided meditation. Someone always had to tell me what to do. I couldn't just, you know, step into meditation. And I was almost really jealous of people that could. So I went on this course. I dragged my husband along. Um, he was thought I was crazy. Anyway, he did it with me, supported me. And um, Julian is uh, Julian yeah, is on your <laughs> side, you know. <laughs> he does so, what you um, do. Yeah. NLP. Yeah, let's he, go to NLP. Let's go to uh, yeah, uh, to yeah. yeah. He's always been with me. Let's go and see Tony Robbins. Yeah, okay. He's been used to me, you know, for a lot of years, jumping to different. Um, you know, I like to try everything, but this really, really changed me. So, um, it was forty days, and it was in the morning and in the evening. You had to meditate. It was a certain way. It was, it was quite strict, which also I'm not really into. But I, I did it all. My whole life changed not not just my mindset but my life I couldn't believe it I became this really calm peaceful happy person and everyone was like wow and I think that's what really started me on the on the journey to transformation because uh, I knew I had that ability to do it and um, I didn't realize how bad I was until you know I became better and um, you know so um, you can go to the gym and you can train and you can do all these things. But if your body is under stress um, and you don't know you're under stress, then you, you know, you're going to get sick. And so that's why a lot of um, like the heart rate variability stuff is so big now because you, um, you know, the vagus nerve, which is, which is now, you know, talked about, we could go on to a whole nother, a whole nother session on this. You know, so you know it it is it is stress that it is making us it's making us sick um and so you know um, managing that is is a huge part and and you know like i said that a huge subject in itself talking about the vagus nerve and 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 you know humans used to know if they were stressed or not we don't anymore we really don't and so um it internalizes to disease and you know chronic conditions can come from it as well so that's like when you know it's too late so yes i agree with you 100 percent that stress is probably the the biggest the biggest factor in all these diseases because you cannot expand something all the time you have to relax it and i think again you know it's like expansion and relaxation and let go of it again because otherwise it's always on on mm-hmm. on on and it breaks and, you know, but I would like to invite you another time again, because we could talk, you know, about more topics and uh, interesting topics for our audience. Thank you, Vicky, for having been on the show. It was a real pleasure and learning experience. And thank you, my dear listeners, for joining us today. Thank you, Vicky, for being having been on the show. It was super interesting. Thank you, thank you Joseph, for having me. It's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure. The recap of the show with all the links is in on the website on by the beach.com. If you like this podcast, please subscribe to have you here again for our next episode. This is your host, Joseph Schinwald. Thank you and goodbye until we meet again.